cars with internal combustion engines are dead. Or are they? Porsche has been working on something that could save petrol engines forever. But wait a second, didn't the UK and European Union decide to ban the sale of cars with internal combustion engines from 2035? Well, yes, but this new tech is so exciting that politicians responsible for regulating new car sales just did one of the biggest U-turns in automotive history. It's so big, it's more like a political power slide. And in this video, I'm going to tell you why they changed their minds. I'll explain why Porsche's technology is so important, and I'll tell you how you might be able to carry on buying a brand new cars with exciting internal combustion engines into 2030, 2040 and beyond. I'm Matt Watson and you're watching Car Wow. Buy, sell, Car Wow. It feels like governments all over the world have been waging war against petrol heads. It's one thing to give you a tax break if you buy a zero emissions car, I get that, but plenty of countries have already decided to ban the sale of petrol and diesel powered cars completely. I'm not just talking about Lamborghinis and Ferraris with huge naturally aspirated engines and more than 700 horsepower. I'm talking about any car that comes with an internal combustion engine, even cheap cars like the Dacia Sandero. Even hybrids like the brand new Toyota Prius aren't safe. Why? It all goes back to 2017 when the UK government introduced plans to ban the sale of cars with petrol and diesel engines after 2040. That was surprising enough, but it got worse. The government decided to bring the ban forward. 10 years to 2030. Car makers could carry on selling plug-in hybrids for a few more years, but these cars would also have to go off sale by 2035. This means the only new cars you'll be able to buy after that date will be battery-powered electric cars or cars with hydrogen fuel cells, like the Toyota Mirai. This just didn't apply to UK drivers either. The European Union, Canada and California also decided to ban the sale of internal combustion engine cars from 2035. But there's a problem. In fact, there's quite a few problems. Firstly, lots of car makers weren't particularly happy. On the whole, the people who run car brands are a pretty conservative bunch, with a few noticeable exceptions. Yeah, that guy. They have to be selective about what sort of cars they develop, and they want to get as much usage out of each bit of tech as possible, you know, to maximise profits. Some big names, including Toyota, were getting worried about putting all their eggs in one big electrical car basket, especially when they've poured so much cash into developing cars with internal combustion engines and fancy hybrid drive systems. In fact, in December 2022, the president of Toyota, Akio Toyoda, warned that the silent majority is wondering whether EVs are really OK to have as a single option. He also said the industry needed to be realistic about this goal to stop selling cars with internal combustion engines by 2035. In fairness, Toyota hasn't exactly been leading the electric car push. Sure, it helped make hybrids popular with the Prius, but it didn't launch its first bespoke electric car until the BZ4X came along in 2022. But Toyota isn't the only car maker getting cold feet about the 2035 electric car deadline. BMW is speaking up too. It kicked things off more than 10 years ago with the i3, and now it has loads of EVs on sale, including the i4, the iX3, iX, and the new i7. And it's about to launch the new i5 too. But the company's boss recently said that a pure EV world only works if you have, and I quote, an abundance of renewable energy, a seamless private and public charging infrastructure network, and access to raw materials. And guess what? We don't have all those things right now. So on one hand, you have governments wanting to reduce CO2 emissions from privately owned cars. And on the other hand, you have some of the biggest companies in the world saying that banning internal combustion engines isn't the best way to do this. It looked like they'd reached a stalemate until this week. EU legislators allowed car makers to sell cars with internal combustion engines after 2035 on one condition. They have to run on synthetic fuel. So what on earth is synthetic fuel? And what has this got to do with Porsche. Well, petrol and diesel are made from oil. This oil is drilled out from underground and is made from organic material that has been compressed over millions of years. This is why petrol and diesel are called fossil fuels. Synthetic fuels are completely man-made. You don't have to drill wells to get it out of the ground. These fuels were originally invented around 100 years ago. Since then, this technology has been fine-tuned and developed by companies including Porsche into something called e-fuels. The important thing about e-fuel is that it can help turn any car with an internal 
combustion engine into a carbon neutral vehicle. That's right, you could hoon about in a 911 Turbo S doing 0 to 60 miles an hour in less than 2.6 seconds, and the whole time you'd be emitting net zero carbon dioxide. So how the heck does this work? Well, e-fuels are made using carbon dioxide that's been recovered from the atmosphere or captured as waste from factories. You then use renewable energy to produce hydrogen from water through a process called electrolysis. Then you combine these two together to produce methanol fuel. This can be refined into petrol so it can be burnt in a normal internal combustion engine without any modifications. In fact, Porsche is testing this fuel using its own range of cars and it's working with ExxonMobil to make racing fuel for 911 GT3 racing cars in the Mobile One Super Cup. You can also use this process to make synthetic diesel. This could power commercial vehicles or massive industrial machinery like mining trucks. All these fuels produce carbon dioxide when they burn. But here's the clever part. The carbon dioxide that gets released has already been partially offset because the e-fuel production process takes carbon out of the atmosphere in the first place. So on a global scale, e-fuels have the potential to be carbon neutral and global CO2 emissions are what we need to reduce to help stop climate change. This sounds like a eureka moment because it helps address one of the biggest problems with electric cars, charging. EVs have a decent amount of range these days. I managed to drive more than 320 miles on a full charge in a Mercedes EQS and that's loads more than most people will need on a day-to-day -day basis. But the big problem is charging. Fast DC chargers can give you an 80% charge in around half an hour, but most public ones are a lot slower than that. And it's even worse if you have to charge at home. The Mercedes EQS takes about five hours to charge using a 22 kilowatt wall box, for example. And what happens if you don't have a driveway to charge your car on? Exactly. And that's where e-fuels come in. You can refuel a car using e-fuel in exactly the same amount of time it takes to fill up with normal petrol or diesel. Though, to be fair, e-fuels aren't exactly perfect. You can't actually buy them yet, and the factories making e-fuels are still on the experimental phase. For example, Porsche invested around £82 million in a synthetic fuel factory in Chile. This currently produces 130,000 litres of e-fuel per year, and all of this goes into powering 911 GT3 racing cars in the Mobile One Super Cup. Porsche says it'll increase production to 55 million litres per year by 2026, and then it plans to ramp up to 10 times that amount by 2028. That sounds like quite a lot, doesn't it? But it's nowhere near enough. The USA alone uses 115 billion gallons of oil every year. So you need around 9,600 factories like the one in Chile just to keep America going. And there's another problem. Synthetic fuels like e-fuels are only carbon neutral if the electricity used to make them comes from renewable zero emission sources. This is why Porsche built its factory in Chile. It shows a spot where the wind blows for 270 days per a year and is strong enough to power wind turbines. These produce the electricity the factory uses to create hydrogen from water and combine it with the captured carbon dioxide. You don't have to use wind power to make e-fuels though. You can use hydroelectric power from dams or solar power from solar panels. Now this could be particularly interesting for the current major oil producers such as the UAE and Saudi Arabia. What will all those oil rich countries do when global demand of normal fossil fuel oil drops? Now it's conceivable that they could pivot to e-fuel production using solar energy. After all, Saudi Arabia gets 340 hours of sunshine during its sunniest month, while the UK gets just 220 hours. Now, nothing is going to change overnight, and electric cars aren't going anywhere either. This new EU ruling leads to a way of scaling up e-fuel production in the coming decades. And it means that some of today's iconic cars and car makers won't necessarily go extinct if they can't afford to switch their entire production to electric cars by 2035. It paves the way for all sorts of interesting future developments, and it leaves the door open for people whose jobs or lifestyles aren't compatible with electric cars. The conversation around cars has just turned on its head. Everything's changed. It's EVs and e-fuel all the way from here. I hope you'll enjoyed the video. If you did, give it a like. Let me know what you think of it in the comments below. If you want to watch some more videos, I've picked a couple out for you there. I think you'll like it. Just click on those windows to watch them. Or if you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe to this channel. You can do that just by hitting the Carwell logo there. Simple.